Well, it's, uh, it's great to be with all of you, and uh, this is joint work carried out over the last uh, 14 years now with my colleague Mark Stokel, who's uh, here as well. And, uh, but it's really a, a celebration of all of you. And let me say, uh, having been born and raised in New York, I think this is absolutely the best program because it keeps helping me discover things about New York. For example, I had never been to St. Mary's Park in Mott Haven, and a couple of years ago, some of the students from Hostos Lincoln had a great, a really great project on the ants of St. Mary's Park. So I went up to St. Mary's Park a, a few weeks later and I was walking around looking at all kinds of things and someone actually stopped me and said, well, what are you doing here? And I said, well, I came to look at the ants. They, they thought I was crazy, but uh, oh, it's really amazing because it just, you know, you, you really, it's, there's a whole other city that we're discovering. There's this uh, sort of, the, the city that everybody knows, and then there's this sort of secret city of, uh, of uh, all these, all these uh, critters and, uh, and plants. It's just fantastic. Uh, well, I, I want to share with you uh, a little bit of the history of barcoding and some of the adventures we've had. Uh, barcoding began because of a very practical problem. There were lots of uh, T of, of species, lots of taxonomic groups like uh, moths and butterflies, where it was really hard to tell what you were looking at because uh, things looked so similar. And you know, were they the, the same sp the, the same species at a different life stage, or were you know, is it, was it just like people with with uh, brown eyes and blue eyes, uh, or were they really different? So in natural history museums, like uh, our museum here, there were drawers like this, full of specimens, and people were, really weren't sure uh, whether we were getting the taxonomy right, were we giving the right names to things. And then you'd go out into nature and see uh, caterpillars like these, uh, from a, this is a tropical butterfly, the Astraptes, and you know, the one on the top looks sort of like the one next to it, the Trigo and the Kelt, and the, uh, you know, the, the Lancho looks sort of like the Lohamp, and there were all these arguments saying, well, is, are these actually 10 different uh, butterflies or is it just one that has uh, uh, di different appearances because of what it's been eating? And so we realized we needed, to, we needed new techniques, uh, we needed to, new kinds of evidence like DNA to, uh, to learn whether these things were really similar or different. And then there were practical problems in the world too, social problems, societal challenges. For example, a lot of the sharks in the world are being killed, the fins taken and turned into uh, soup, shark fin soup. Uh, people pay more than $100 a bowl for sometimes for shark fin soup. And a lot of the, sh the fins were coming from illegal fishing. But how could you prove that the fins were from illegal fishing? If all you had was the fin, well, you know, how could you know that that was coming from a hammerhead shark or a thresher shark or some particular kind of shark that people shouldn't be catching? So how could, uh, you know, the, uh, the, the good guys in sort of CSI uh, uh, prove uh, that uh, uh, something came from a plant or animal that was threatened or endangered? Or tuna, uh, lots, lots of fish stories. Uh, well, you know, if, you're, if you were given some some, uh, if you just have a frozen fillet of fish or a can of tuna, can you say whether it comes from big eye, which is a fish that, uh, tuna, species of tuna that can be fished, or from southern bluefin, which is one that's uh, restricted? <clears throat> and then here in New York, uh, way back in 1999, around the time some of you were born or a little earlier, uh, the first cases of West Nile virus cropped up in Queens. And it's really hard to tell apart the different, uh, the different mosquitoes that, uh, that might or might not carry West Nile virus. So and there are very few experts who can do that. And even the experts with really good knowledge uh, and expertise have trouble. And then sometimes you might not find the mature animal. You might find eggs or larval stages. And then you're really in trouble. So we knew we needed to do something different. And, uh, there's this revolution happening in life sciences and biology, uh, uh, DNA, genetics. Uh, and uh, we realized, well, uh, DNA is like a barcode, like a product barcode, that the, the TCAG, all of which you've learned about, uh, could be turned into a, into a unique identifier 
for, uh, for different species. Here you see a robin uh, and, and uh, a fly, and they're different, they're different. And uh, if you can get just a, a, you know, a, a hundred or, or 600 base pairs, uh, it could, you could tell the species apart. So as uh, Allison and Christine mentioned, a bunch of us got together in 2003 at a meeting uh, out at Cold Spring Harbor on Long Island, about an hour and a half from here, and we struggled with the question of, would this be possible? Uh, is, you know, was the technology ripe? Could the computers do the job? And we came to the conclusion that it could be done. And it had lots of advantages, because you could look at fragments. Uh, a, lot of, a lot of the time, you might just have a fragment of an animal, like in the same way you may only have a piece of an airplane, uh, sometimes you have only a fin uh, or a bone or a tooth. Uh, and then you have this problem of life stages that I mentioned. You know, do you have a, a caterpillar or a, 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 a swallowtail butterfly? And then you have all these uh, insects, like groups like uh, fruit flies or mosquitoes, where there are thousands of them and they look very similar. So it's really hard just using the human eye. So the DNA can give you high accuracy and resolution and with all these things, and it doesn't care whether you have only a fragment or a life stage or the lookalikes, there's DNA in every cell. And what's more, it would empower more experts. Uh, all of you are now experts. Uh, you know, if you take a, an important species, uh, uh, the, the, uh, or a popular species, uh, like fish or birds, maybe there are 10,000 people in the entire world who are really experts in uh, ornithology or in ichthyology. But for a lot of really important groups, there are only a handful of people. And even for the popular groups, of course, people are, uh, uh, you know, there's lots of, there's just a lot to know. There are 30,000 different species, known species of fishes. It's hard to keep pictures of the, all of those in your head. And it could speed discovery of new things, and it could simplify and miniaturize. And we've been holding out the idea that by 2020, we'll have a handheld barcoder. Well, from 2004 to 2009, uh, the movement grew, and we made it to the front page of some of the science magazines, which was pretty cool. And we built up the reference libraries. And as all of you have seen in your projects, this technique relies on having, you have to compare A to B. If you don't have something in the library, you can't match it. Uh, you, can, you may be able to say it's new or it's not there, and that's exciting too. But obviously, if you want to say it's the kind of mosquito that carries West Nile, you have to have that in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, in the reference library. So we put a lot of effort into building up the reference libraries. <clears throat> and then in 2008, a really wonderful thing happened. Two high school students uh, here in the city uh, came to us at Rockefeller and said they wanted, they were seniors, they wanted to do uh, an extra project for uh, their, for in, in biology, their senior year. And we asked, what are you interested in? And uh, they said, well, we like eating sushi. So we said, that's great. Why don't you go around the city to restaurants and fish stores and collect sushi, and then we'll analyze it with DNA. And they ended up uh, uh, publishing an article in a magazine called Pacific Fishing, which not a lot of New Yorkers regularly read, but the New York Times caught wind of it and put them on the front page with uh, the start of the Sushi Gate scandal. Uh, and it turned out a quarter of all the samples uh, they collected were mislabeled, and every time it was uh, an inexpensive or undesirable fish being sold as something expensive. And it happened in lots of places. And uh, the, uh, uh, so, you know, instead of uh, white albacore tuna, which you see on the left, it was actually, for example, a, a Mozambique tilapia. So that, uh, that really energized us. And, lots of you, and we, it was clear that lots of people could participate and be really good at this, uh, including young people. And so there have been a series of these wonderful projects uh, uh, over the years, uh, often under the, the, uh, the auspices of the, the Urban Barcode Project. Uh, now, for example, in 2009, there was a student, another student project called DNA House. Uh, Brenda Tan and Matt Cost tried to find everything in their apartments and nearby that they could trace to a plant or animal. The equipment for it, we got in auctions on eBay. Uh, the, uh, we were able to put together on, uh, on a dining table on, uh, on an apartment on the west side, a pretty, pretty good laboratory for less than $5,000. 
And uh, with that, with doing the testing there, they found that from the samples they'd collected, there were 95 different animal species. And as they say, you probably wouldn't believe me if I told you that all of the species displayed above were found in local supermarkets and homes in New York. A feather from a duster yielded ostrich DNA. A delicacy labeled sturgeon caviar turned, instead turned out to be from the strange looking paddlefish, actually a Mississippi paddlefish. And an Asian snack was a giant flying squid and a dog biscuit had bison meat in it. Very cool things. And of course, again, there was a lot of mislabeling uh, as some of the projects here uh, this year also examine. Uh, sheep's milk cheese uh, that was actually from cow's milk and, and so forth. And they even found a new species, what we think may be a new species of cockroach, the sort of mascot of New York City. Uh, so I'll come back to that in a moment. In 2010, there was a really neat project on teas uh, uh, three students at Trinity went around the city and Chinatown and different places collecting lots of teas, uh, I think a total of 146 different kinds of teas all together. Damon Little, who's here, was one of the mentors of that project along with Mark. And uh, you know, if you have these powders on the upper right, it's very hard to say what that comes from. Now if you were out in a field, uh, tea, a tea plantation in, in China or India or Kenya, as the picture on the upper left, you might be able, to, you might know what the tea plant is, but if all you're getting is what's in, in the box or the bag, it's really hard to say. And it turned out a third of the herbal teas had ingredients that were not listed on the, on the label. So uh, weird things go on, and then you can do neat scientific things with that information. Here, for example, is a, a, a heat map, a, a kind of similarity map based on genetics, taking a whole bunch of different kinds of tea plants. And so you can see tea plants cluster visually into asters and mints and lindens and roses, if those of you like rosehip teas and so forth, and, and grasses. So you can really sort of see the world in, in new ways uh, through the technique. Another project, uh, Robin Say, uh, this won an honorable mention in the Urban Barcode Project in 2012, worked with folks at, the, uh, at Newark Airport. Uh, lots of stuff comes into, into uh, the airports in America, including lots of stuff with insects, uh, and in some cases insects that we really don't want to, to grow and spread here. But it's hard to identify them. Uh, you know, they may come from an order like the Hempitera, where you, there are 50,000 species, the squash bug. Uh, it's really hard to know, is that really a dangerous one or not? And Robin, to working together with some of the folks from uh, the, uh, with the Fish and Wildlife Service and the, the uh, uh, con control folks at the uh, Newark Airport, was able to identify a bunch of things, including some things that we really don't want. Now, cockroaches, most of you probably don't want in your apartments, but we actually have a kind of different view of cockroaches. Co cockroaches are actually not dangerous. They're yucky, but uh, they don't carry dangerous diseases, you know, you won't, you won't get malaria from a cockroach. You, uh, but uh, we, so we started something called the National Cockroach Project and uh, about 85 different people contributed more than 300 cockroaches, mostly from the city and from other places. And uh, was even covered in Russian papers, if we have any young Russians with us. The, you can see the last, the last two words on the right in Russian are New, York, New Yorka. Uh, and uh, the Wall Street Journal, which mostly covers uh, financial cockroaches, covered our cockroaches too. Uh, well, so we were doing lots of things with tissues, collecting real specimens, and Mark, a couple of years ago, thought, well, what about uh, fishing for just for DNA? Because uh, animals shed DNA like we shed dandruff. They, the, animals are shedding DNA in, all, in the water all the time, and usually when people have been collecting fish, they do it with nets, but we wondered, well, maybe we could just collect water. So the last couple of years, uh, we've been going out and collecting water samples around the city, uh, out in Jamaica Bay, uh, uh, down off the Jersey Shore, uh, Hudson the East River, and then you just filter the water, it's sort of like a, through a coffee filter, except it's a, a nylon filter, and then you can extract the DNA from the sort of goo or the dried out powder you get from the, the filter. 
And then we've been amplifying a, a, a small section, 110 base pairs of 12S of mitochondrial DNA, putting it through a sequencer and then matching it to the library. And we've been getting great results. The first place we worked was right here across the street in Central Park. Uh, uh, Iman and Alden, two uh, uh, high school students, uh, went and collected uh, water in the pool and in the lock in the Harlem Mare, which is just a, you know, a couple hundred yards from here. And what did they get? Amazing, amazing results. On the left, you see the, the number of reads of the fishes, pumpkin seed, a lot of pumpkin seed, a lot of bluegill, quite a few banded killifish, uh, some brown bullhead, seven different species of fish. And then on the right, you see they also got other stuff, raccoon, Birds, rats, there's rat DNA everywhere. There's even rat DNA in the air in New York. If you breathe deeply, you're breathing in a little rat DNA. It's not dangerous, but uh, it's, uh, it's there. Uh, so we thought, this is fantastic, and we need to do a little more verification. So we went out to the New York Aquarium. And on the left, you see a shark tank. In the middle, a walrus tank. And on the right, penguins. And we tested there, also in a tropical reef tank. And again, we got really good results. And of course, the people, the curators of the aquarium know, what, know what's in the tanks. So we were able to, to compare the, uh, just the DNA against the, the information about the, the animals, the, the specimens in the tank. And that gave us confidence to go out and try more experimentally. <clears throat> so for those of there are some Fieldston kids here, I know. This is the Spoyton Dival from near Baker Field looking to the, the big blue apartment building on the upper left in Riverdale. Uh, uh, there's a uh, kind of uh, sort of bay, bay there, uh, very nice area. So we collected some DNA and we got uh, mummachog, which is a, a, a small uh, fish that's also very, can live in a lot of different conditions. Uh, we got some Atlantic silver sides, white perch, and even a little bit of striped bass, but mostly the minnows living in the, in the salt marsh. And then we went down under the George Washington Bridge. There's a red lighthouse there. Some of you have probably been there. And we got a very different collection of fish, as you'd expect in the, uh, uh, in the, in the, in the Hudson, uh, including American eel and shad. And then we went right next to Rockefeller University on the East River, looking at the 59th Street Bridge in Roosevelt Island. And we got menhaden, which is like a herring, and then another herring species, sea bass, uh, anchovies, bluefish. And in each case, we got different amounts of DNA, uh, different numbers of reads for the different species. So we thought, well, we can probably do not only diversity, but we may be able to sort of rank species or index them by abundance. And so we compared the success of our method with what the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration does using nets. And we got seven of the top 10 same species as they did using eDNA. And they had three that, that they ranked higher. And we had three, cunner, eel, and oyster toadfish that were, were three where we got different rankings. And we thought that's pretty interesting. And you know we'll have to try to learn which is more accurate. Well, then we started collecting week by week in the East River and in the Hudson. Uh, and uh, in, these, uh, in the char these six charts in the middle, time is going by from uh, January 1st, the start, the cold start of the, the new year in the middle of the winter, to July uh, uh, on the right side. And you can see that as the water warms, there's more DNA. So the fish start migrating, and there starts being more DNA. You see the, the water temperature rising on the bottom two charts, and they're, they're the, uh, the number of spe fish species goes up as the water warms, and the number of actual, the, total, just the amount of DNA you get from the water goes up. So we thought that's pretty cool. But there were some unexpected things too. Uh, about 1% of the fish reads were weird things that we didn't expect, uh, like catfish uh, or whitefish or even Atlantic salmon. And then we thought, well, wait, maybe that's not so weird because that comes out in the wastewater. Uh, if you go to a fish store and you buy these or you go to a restaurant, then <coughs> some of those species, you're digesting them, but you don't break up all the DNA. And that could go out into the wastewater stream. Or just uh, the tissue from the fish store or the restaurant could be going into the, the wastewater treatment. So it turns out that uh, eDNA in, in seawater 
is a way to learn about human diet, something the anthropologists think is pretty cool. And in fact, we found other stuff. We found non-fish vertebrate DNA, as we did in Central Park. So we found chicken, lots of chicken. People eat, really eat a lot of chicken these days. Pig, pork chops, turkey, cow, rat. Again, there's rat everywhere. Uh, dogs, because of course there are dogs, lots of dogs living in the city, and, and uh, uh, you know, even skunks and deer. So that we thought, that's pretty cool. And shout out for the Bronx. Uh, not only St. Mary's Park, Bronx has a great river, of course, the Bronx River running down from Westchester and down through the Bronx and out through Soundview uh, into Long Island Sound. And together with some folks from the Wildlife Conservation Society and, and the City University of New York, we did some collecting uh, in, uh, in, the, in the Bronx River and we got fantastic results. Uh, eel, carp, darters, uh, sunfish, and then animals too on the lower right. Chipmunk, rabbit, toad, squirrel, vole. And a lot of these are nocturnal and would be really hard to find if you went out to do a traditional biodiversity survey. So the water was telling us all these things. The water is even telling us about the, the DNA, the DNA barcodes of the DNA in the water, even telling us about the return of whales and dolphins to New York City. Some of you may have seen these photographs of their humpback whales within sight of the city. There were even humpback whales under the George Washington Bridge last October. Uh, so we started testing for, for whales and dolphins, and we got some, whale, uh, some dolphin DNA out of the East River uh, last August, and uh, of course along the Jersey Shore, lots of, of dolphin DNA. Well, all of these projects, as you can see, uh, are uh, collaborations. Uh, uh, it's you. So you see uh, uh, Alden and Iman, and you see uh, uh, Liubov and Robin, and uh, uh, Kate and Louisa, and uh, uh, Matt and Brenda, and Rohan and Grace. And, uh, uh, and it's this fantastic process of thinking about what to study, defining a problem, then the fun of going out, whether it's St. Mary's Park or the, the Bronx River, uh, 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 collecting ants or collecting, collecting some water, and then uh, building the reference library, analyzing, interpreting. Now, I want to just say one serious word before closing. A lot of the time, we're searching for differences. We want to say, you know, this is a different kind of, uh, of ant from that. But uh, we've also learned by doing this how much how, how strong the similarities are. And this is a chart from a paper that, that Mark and our colleague David Thaler published uh, last September. And all those blue dots are different bird species. And they show the, the similarity within a population of birds of the DNA of that species, like the house sparrow. And then up above that, you see the differences of two primates, the bonobo and the chimpanzee. And you can see if you two bonobos or two chimpanzees typically might be 1% different for the barcode region. The birds, it's much less than that. And you see humans on the lower right, you know, there are about 7 billion humans on the right. That's a very big population. Uh, the, uh, the, the next dot to the, the humans on the left, the first blue dot there, is uh, uh, the house sparrows. Let's say there are 500 million house sparrows. But we're actually, from the point of view of barcodes, humans are the same as sparrows. So I think it's really important at a time in the world when there are all these problems and people are fighting and quarreling, it's fantastic to discover diversity, but it's also really important to remember how, how much we have in common. And that's another of the things we learn from, from barcoding. So next time you start quarreling with your teachers or whoever, your parents, uh, remember that if you look at a bunch of pigeons or a bunch of sparrows, they're really they're, they're as different one from another as we are, or they're as similar. So it's important to, to discover differences, but it's also important to appreciate what we have in common. Well, I just want to close by saying we have an incredible future, uh, thanks to the barcoding and uh, projects like the Urban Barcode Project. You know, we'll have traditional uh, efforts. Uh, on the left in this uh, picture, you see a vessel loaded with equipment to go to sea. But on the right, you see a, a, 
a drone, a little quadcopter drone you could buy at, uh, at uh, Walmart for very little money, lowering a vial into the water to collect water which you could filter and, uh, and get DNA out of and do DNA barcoding. So you know, a, a, a kind of really wonderful democratization is taking place which is your participation, but also the fact that the cost of doing, learning about nature, you know, you don't have to spend, let's say, a hundred million dollars on a big research vessel and all this equipment. You can learn amazing things now uh, in your own labs, on a dining room table or at your school, uh, just going out, collecting a cup of water or collecting some ants uh, and using DNA subway and uh, uh, using, using your own minds. So thanks very much.